Hey, Marty, what is your definition of storytelling? Yeah, so my definition of storytelling is more about what it does to the consumer's brain than what actually storytelling is. So I think storytelling is part of human nature. Storytelling has been part of like the way we communicate with each other since the beginning of times. And we could see, you know, like the paintings in the caves, those were stories. And stories help us share lessons, help us share best practices, both from a survival standpoint back then. And it has eventually evolved into how we communicate in business, in marketing, but also from a human to human standpoint. So I think when we understand what storytelling is, the way of communicating and the way of sharing something in a way that um, captivates the audience and makes them understand through context is what allows people to really believe in something and actually care for, and as a marketer or business person, actually get their credit card out and pay for it. Yeah. Um, so the marketer, the business person that uh, dominates storytelling is the one that dominates the way we communicate at its coarsest, most raw uh, human nature. I, I think we see that in business, we see that in marketing, but we see it in every single area of our lives. Yeah. Uh, we see that in politics. We see that in the way I communicate with my uh, girlfriend, with my mother, uh, the way I communicate with my employees. Uh, so storytelling has helped us uh, build these relationships in a, in a more honest and raw way than anything that was other possible. Awesome. I think that might be my favorite definition that I've heard thus far from a guest. And I, I'm going to add a, a little piece of uh, my two cents to it as well. I think so many of us get wrapped up in the facts telling aspect of marketing and of business, right? So what's, what are the dimensions of this widget? Um, what are the, the features? Um, how are we keeping up with the Joneses with our competitors? Like, oh, they do this and we do that too. Uh, but really, I think that the best brands, the most effective brands, the most effective um, companies and, and individuals for that matter are the ones that tell story because story ties those facts together um, sometimes in a narrative, sometimes not, sometimes just in, um, the, the way that like, uh, abstract ideas are communicated and explained. So, um, yeah, again, I think that's your definition of storytelling is, is very near and dear to our heart. Um, and yeah. I think that might be my favorite one that I've heard thus far, but obviously we're biased. Of course. I mean, I had no doubt that mine was going to be the right. <laughs> So Marty, speaking of story, what is your story and, and what do we need to know about you and influence podium? Yeah, I think my story starts in, in the place where I was born. I was born in Boone, North Carolina, a small uh, town, um, a college campus. Um, but I was born to Spanish parents who were there really breaking through something that was hardly ever seen in Spain, which is people uh, moving to the States back in you know, the 90s um, to work. My dad was a basketball coach, and, and he coached at Appalachian State. And my mom is an English teacher in Spain and a Spanish teacher in the States. Um, and they were kind of breaking through and pioneering something that eventually I got to do later on, 20 years later. Mm -hmm. um, but I was born there. I moved back to Spain when I was six months old. I was a baby in an airplane. I don't remember anything about the United States. I just got a passport. And that passport didn't mean anything to me back then. But it meant a lot 20 years later. Yeah. I was raised in Spain and... Um, I considered myself Spanish. I played basketball here in high school, but there was part of me, you know, the, I had a fragmented identity. I had my identity that I related to the Spanish way of doing, you know, the beers, the tapas, the, the jamón, the let's enjoy time with our friends and let's have dinner at 10 p.m. until 2 a.m. in the morning and then go out until 6 a.m. But I had a, a part that I didn't know where it came from, which was my ambitious part, which was my, uh, I want to start something and do business uh, that came from the United States. And I was extremely competitive um, compared to everybody else here in Spain. Um, at 17, I had to make a choice and I decided that if I wanted to continue playing basketball, I wanted to do it in the United States. Um, the passport came in handy because it allowed me to, to go there. Uh, but it, it was such a big breakthrough for me in terms of like leaving my family, leaving my culture, I had never been in the States other than the time that I was born, um, living my language. So I, I got on a flight, I was 17, 
Um, and I was like, well, hopefully this works out and fuck it, you know? Uh, fuck it has been the two words that have really <laughs> Every good decision I've made came after fuck it. Yeah. Um, so I went to the States. I, I played college basketball for four years. I loved it. Uh, I felt at home in the United States. Um, when, I, when I went to the airport, it's, it's a quick story, but I, I get there at 17. I, I land in the airport um, in Charlotte, North Carolina after eight hours of flight. I'm nervous, I don't understand the language. I thought I did, but then English is harder than what I thought it was. Sorry. Uh, no, it was, I mean, Spanish is harder when you come here than when they teach in, in, in yeah. high school space. Uh, but I got there, I don't know where I'm going. I've never been to an airport by myself. Um, I ask, I barely understand what they're telling me. And I get to the security guy, and he starts asking me questions of like, what are you doing here? Um, uh, what's the reason for your visit? Do you have anything that you want to report? And I'm like, look, I'm playing basketball. I have no idea what I'm doing here. I'm, hold, let me just, please let, just let me go. I think my coach is there waiting. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, uh, welcome home, Mr. Sancho. And I was like, for me, it meant a lot. I remember it was seven or eight years ago and it was like the beginning of, of a change for myself, right? Um, five years later, I've graduated to have an MBA, start working in finances. Um, I was told that I would get a six-figure job. Then I found out it was an unpaid until I got some clients. I was like, fuck this. I'm not doing it. Let me go back home and figure it out. Uh, I was dealing with mental health at the time. I was struggling personally. And all I knew how to do was write. When I was in college, I was on the NCAA, so I couldn't work uh, additional hours. But I needed to make some extra cash. I come from a single mom, um, so I went to... Um, make some money, you know, to go to McDonald's down the road. Even so, I would write my classmates' paper for ten dollars a page, and they were <laughs> they were English from New Hampshire, super white, um, English native, and here was the Spanish guy with an accent who just got there four months ago. Yeah, uh, writing their papers for them and saying, "If you get less than a V, I give you your money back." <laughs> <laughs> and I would write, you know, I would write seven papers of the same thing for seven classmates, and I'd make it. 200 bucks wow. uh, and it, I loved it because I, I love how to writing it's been part of my life since I was a kid um, and then I did well let's do what I know let's write and I started as a freelance ghostwriter um, I wrote on Quora for six months every day I got a couple million views people started reaching out to me I loved uh, I I didn't know how it was called but I learned about personal branding mm. and content creation and how I wanted people to come reach out to me because of my content mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know what it was called. I, I, and eventually I found out this is what personal branding is, this is what content is. And when we started getting too many clients, I started building the agency on top of it. And you know, hiring writers, hiring brand managers. Um, and we're doing the same thing I was doing for my classmates in, in college, but now for some of the best CEOs in the world. So that's a long story of like how I got here. Um, and it's been a lot of back and forth. It's been exciting. And I have hopefully a, a, lot of, a long way to go still. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for the context, which is the, the whole basis of story, right? So yeah. here we are. We have a, a, a Spanish dude uh, who really came of age in the States, trying to figure out what he was trying to do, loved writing, ended up taking that passion, uh, doing it basically for free or for like, for what many people would consider scraps, right? For McDonald's money. Uh, yeah. And then figuring out and honing his craft enough to get to the point where people were, were ready, willing, and able to, to hand, them, hand him thousands of dollars to write for them as if it were them, right? Like when you talk about story and like living your truth, like that's it, right? And yeah. that's why I think the authenticity of, of what you're doing um, and, and why you're able to grow your business even through COVID and, and pandemic, like that's just a true testament to your story. Yeah, it's been, it's been an exciting uh, journey. And, and a lot of times, to be honest, I didn't know what I was doing. Like yeah. I remember when I was in the States and I was working at the, at the finance job, I worked there for a month and two weeks in, I was like, mom, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. Um, yeah. I mean, I was 21. I had my master's already then. Um, and, and I was super struggling with mental health. And I remember I had a panic attack and I called my mom and I was like, if I can get on the next flight, I'm coming. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember sitting down with her, on a, on a coffee shop because they had invested a lot into me getting in college, getting an MBA, getting a job in finance, which was our ideal life, right? The yeah. standard, like that, that's what we want to do. 
uh, as a family and, and myself, I thought that's what I wanted to do. And I told her, I, I want to write. And she was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it, and eventually it worked out, right? But sometimes yeah. I think back to these conversations, I'm like, right. I'm scared. Or I have like, um, you know, fear of heights a little bit of looking back and, and seeing where we are now. Yeah. Uh, but but it's, it's been a, an interesting story for, for myself. And, and obviously uh, there's other people that have similar stories, but, but it's been... It's in my driving force, you know, like yeah. that story of like, this is who I am as a person. I'm going what after what I want to do. Um, and hopefully it comes out. If it doesn't come out, at least we'll, we'll learn and we'll try again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, if you're not hooked yet uh, to our, our viewing and listening audience, I don't know what's going to make you more hooked. I mean, this is somebody who's like literally living his truth. Um, and I think because he's so authentic and organic in that respect, Marty, you probably got a lot of tips and tricks about how to use storytelling in marketing. You're probably using this every single day, right? So let, let's walk through that. Tell me a little bit about how you use story to help your clients uh, get seen as, as not just thought leaders, but action leaders in their spaces. Yeah, so I was, I was interviewing uh, Andy in, in my podcast, which I, I'll connect you guys because I think this, he would be an ideal guest, even better than myself. Uh, and he works with this whole something called strategy, strategic narrative. Mm -hmm. So he works with companies and CEOs, uh, find their narrative and find their story. And, and he's the expert at this, right? And he has this bunch of questions that he asks when he works with the clients um, to find what the narrative, what the narrative is. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do that at a smaller scale, but I'm happy to like share what we, what we can do. Um, for, for myself, especially as a ghostwriter, when I used to be a ghostwriter, um, which sometimes I miss, by the way, uh, the key here is understanding what their story and what their narrative behind what they want to put out company is and comes from. Mm -hmm. So as a ghostwriter, you have to, I always tell my ghostwriters now that you have to become an actor. Mm -hmm. You know, an actor really becomes the person that they act for or that they represent. Yeah. Uh, as a ghostwriter, you have to become the individual. And that comes from learning about their story um, and things that probably don't even relate, but they can mark the nuances in terms of their content uh, that will actually make it sound like that. Yeah. Um, so something that we do with all our clients, for example, is before we ever put out a piece of content, is have a conversation about like, let's ask you a bunch of questions about your story. And like, where do you come from? Um, what's been your motivation? What's your mission personally and as a company? Uh, and when you really dive deep and, and nail down what the story is, that's when you can start creating content both from a personal brand and from a company. Um, so for us, it comes a lot in terms of like strategy and auditing the story before we ever put out content. The work is done before. The content is just a reflection of that. Yeah. What do you say to people uh, when they first hear the word story or storytelling and they're, they're a business person, right? And they think, man, storytelling, that's, that's for little kids, right? Those are bedtime stories. That's dragons and knights and princesses. Um, none of that's relevant for me. What do you say to someone like that? Well, there's two things. Depending on how much money they pay me, I say, fuck it, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> so I just got off a call, so maybe this is because I'm pissed off about it. Or somebody that like, you try to share what you're doing and they don't get it. And if it's not going to come through that, right. they're not going to get it, they're not going to get it. So don't, come, don't even try to convince them. Uh, for others who are like, just more open to that, I mean, I try to like, show them examples of stories that they actually understand, right? Yeah. Like if they're athletes, you can share them a story about Nike, right? Yeah. Whether you like Nike or not, whether you support Black Lives Matter or not, I don't want to get into that. Like they've done a tremendous job in terms of marketing and, and finding stories that their target audience finds relevant, yeah. right? So if they're an athlete, I, I talk about um, Nike. If they're tech, I talk about the story of Apple, you know, how Steve Jobs build the story of Apple and, and how it's really branding. Story is branding. Yeah. A good brand has a story behind it that people actually give a fuck about. It. Yeah. And it's really hard for people to care about stuff. And they only will if they have a backhanded story that mm -hmm. they relate, that they believe in and they want to support. Um, we see that a lot in B2C, mm -hmm. but and, and not that much in B2B. And I think that's why the companies that know how to do it in B2B have a huge differentiating factor um, versus their competition because it's not that used, right? right? And a lot of B2B organizations are more sales oriented 
versus story and, and marketing and branding oriented. So if you're a B2B CEO, I'd say this is something that can be your huge differentiating factor, your value proposition versus your competition that can allow you to increase prices, get, gain market share, recruit the best people, and actually build something that people care for. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's something that the ROI is there. It's not even about telling stories. It's about, do you want an ROI? Then focus on this because it's proven to be valuable. I, I think that's a really good point. And I think so much of like the, the aspect of storytelling, again, if we're associating it with like B2C or we're associating it with like, like, like when you were a kid, yeah. um, if you just reframe storytelling as content marketing, which effectively, in my opinion, that's what it is. Like it's branding, it's content marketing, it's showing people instead of just telling people, right? And that's where we get back to like that fact telling or storytelling thing. Um, and then you, you amplify all of that with how distrustful individuals are of brands today, right? Like, okay, great, company X, Y, and Z is doing whatever, but it turns out they're using slave labor in a third world country. Like, ah, uh, shit, that's not good, right? So as like a society, like we're, we're less trustful over the brands, but the ones that have uh, really fundamental stories that are core to, to their nature and their DNA, really, because that's what it is, those are the ones that stand out. And obviously we can pull so many from B2C, whether it's Patagonia or Nike or, or what have you. But I even look at like B2B, uh, the best brands in B2B right now are the ones that are, are showing and documenting their journey. And like they're leading with their why at every single moment in time. And uh, I don't care if like you're a sales enablement platform, like outreach or whatever, like outreach, they started, they built a piece of software that's going to help their own sales staff close more deals faster, right? right? Like that's that's like the definition of, of, of being a chef and eating your own cooking. And when you have that as like your North Star, um, you never have to like worry about where you get lost in what I'll call lost in the content sauce, right? Like, oh shit, we gotta hit this email, go out, we have to publish 15 blog posts, what about this video and should we be podcasting? I don't know. Uh, but if you are staying true to your North Star, which you know, in, in my opinion, in our opinion, is story and, and content, um, you don't have to worry about getting lost out in the wilderness. What do you think about that? And I think it can even go further than content. So I think content is probably like 80%, right? Yeah. But even from like a design standpoint, like a copy for your uh, website standpoint, uh, how you interact, like how your salespeople interact, how your client facing individuals interact with the, with the clients. Yeah. I mean, I think it goes further Content is a huge step because I think it's how you communicate with your target audience on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, but each interaction and each detail of uh, the company should represent the story. Yeah. Uh, the, the guy that I was talking at, Andrew Raskin, like one of the things that they do is, or, or that he was struggling with at the beginning, was you know, when they were talking about strategic narrative, people were just thinking it's the copy on the landing page. It's not just that. It, that's part of it. But it's the why behind it. Yeah. And that's why it applies to copy, to content, to customer service, to every single element of the company, of the machine. Uh, and if when you lead with your why, which I love the way you put it, then it all aligns into one story, into one voice, into one reason. Um, so, so that's how organizations as a whole can change. I, I think it minimizes if we just say it's content. Right. Content is a huge part, but there's, there's more than that goes with it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think you brought up something that, that's also worth discussing. Storytelling doesn't just help your external efforts. It doesn't just help the, the way that you're going to market with um, your sales staff, or your marketing staff, or, or outward content. Um, story actually really helps galvanize internally in organizations. So if somebody, even from like the very beginning of the recruitment process, all the way to day one of being hired, day 365 and then onward, if the story or the narrative is consistent and the experience matches what uh, they expected, you've created like a super brand ambassador for yourself. And that's when you see people come to work like excited because they're mission driven. They know that they are part of the solution that's solving uh, a world's problem, right? And that is so fundamentally important. Uh, I think now more than ever, especially with work from home and, and the different nature of how we're, we're actually doing business. But um, if you don't buy into the idea of story being helpful from an external perspective, well, you sure should better think about it from an internal perspective too. 
Absolutely. Uh, and, and like I said, I think as marketers, sometimes marketing is half art, half science, mm. right? Mm. And a lot of CEOs, which we're also CEOs, we understand both sides, they're much more focused on the financial side. Like, right. is this going to be an ROI possible? And as marketers, sometimes we need to understand that we have to talk their language to get what we actually want. And a lot of marketers fail to do that because they are not good business people. They're mm -hmm. creative and they're, um, and they're smart individuals, but they don't understand how to run an actual business or what a person who runs a business cares for. Yeah. Uh, so when we communicate that, I think North Star has to be, this is going to bring ROI in this way, right? Or this way. It's not going to be Facebook ads that you put three bucks and you can say, okay, we've got five bucks, so it's good. Uh, but the ROI is going to be there in this in these three different ways. Right? Yeah. You're going to get better people. We're going to get um, in, more inbound opportunities. We're going to uh, achieve results from these um, sequences in, in this way back. So when we communicate that, or, or you're trying to push that down the company, it, it's important to, to talk in their language, I think. Yeah. Uh, and in addition to that, another point I want to make is, and this might be a shameless plug, but that's why I think it's so important the personal brand of the CEO is creating content because yeah. you can have this why, but if your CEO doesn't talk to the audience and is not someone who's leading the narrative and who's leading the storytelling, then what are you doing? Right? Like we all look that we'll look up to our leaders um, for guidance. Yeah. And if your CEO is not taking an actual proactive step to driving that why and driving that story, then you're missing the probably the most important element that somebody could add to, to the, to the story time. Um, so that's why I think it's, yeah. it's huge for CEOs to, to at least create content and to make their voice heard because people internally and externally care for that and, yeah. and they're looking for it. Yeah. Well, now that we've unpacked a lot of the why, and if you're not convinced by now uh, that story is important, then, then maybe <laughs> just log off. But um, I want to talk a little bit about the how and I'm going to lead like the first part of the, the how, and then I want to get your feedback on how I think about it. And then yep. you, know, you can, you can talk about how you guys go about it. Um, but I think the first step is getting that permission slip to, to, to start, right? When you think about a story, what do all, what do all stories have? Um, they have a hero, they have a villain, they have some sort of obstacle, and then they have um, kind of like that journey and then how the hero overcomes um, you know, that obstacle, right? So if you think about it, that context for yourself, I don't care if you're selling copiers or uh, ring lights or whatever, um, the hero in the story needs to be the audience, right? Whoever's going to buy it. You as the storyteller, your job, you're merely the guide, right? Like you're just showing them the way, you're showing them the path to, to get what they want to get. Um, and then some of those obstacles they, they might not even be people. They might not be villains in, in, in disguise. They could actually be like uh, productivity or like cost savings or what have you. So it doesn't have to be like, well, gosh, well, who's the enemy of a copier salesman? Right. Well, it, it actually would be like a, a PDF for cloud-based storage or, or what have you. And cybersecurity becomes a big important factor as opposed to printing out um, copier paper, whatever. Um, so in any case, what are your thoughts there? What are some key elements of story that people can get started with? Yeah, I like uh, in this framework of old world, new world. Mm. Uh, and to get to the old world, we need to kill the new, the, to get to the new world, we need to kill the old world. Yeah. Um, so when we were doing the podcast with him, uh, it, it was very interesting because it started making me think about like, who is our own enemy? Mm. Right? And he then later talks into like market categorization and all that, but we can get into that as well. But like, who is our enemy that we want to kill? And, and when he was talking, that was something that's really sparked my thought. And after we were done with the, with the episode, I went over the weekend and started like really listening and thinking through it. Um, and for ourselves, I, I mean, I think an enemy is the best way to really break through. Right. And like you say, it doesn't have to be a person or, or, um, it can be a cost or it can be an old way of doing stuff. Uh, but for us, for example, I started thinking about what our enemy is and I came to the realization that it probably is PR, right? Mm -hmm. Public relations. So the old way of PR is you pay a PR firm 10,000 bucks, 15,000 bucks, 20,000 bucks a month. They don't have any promised deliverables that they're going to get back to you. Um, hopefully they place you somewhere. 
Yeah. They, they basically pay the Forbes writer to write for them. So it's like they're buying the placement. It's not that they, you have earned it. Then you get placed on Forbes. Forbes doesn't publish it. I mean, doesn't promote it because they don't have to. So it's your job to promote it. But you don't get to pixel people on the side. You don't get to see how many views you're getting. Um, you don't get to see uh, who is consuming the content. All you get is a logo, right? Like we were published on Forbes. And it looks cool because it's credible. But if you can buy it, is it really credible? Right. Right? Suppose it's credible if Forbes said, okay, we want to do a, like uh, an episode on you or an article on you. And, and then you've earned it, sure. But if you're paying 10,000 bucks for one logo that you said, I was on Forbes and everybody knew you bought it, um, I, I think that's the old way of sharing your story, right? As a company or as a personal brand. Um, and I think it's an ego focused way of marketing your company versus actually earning your audience and putting content on LinkedIn, putting content on Twitter, writing on Medium, mm -hmm. having your own podcast. So on our, as a strategic narrative for us is we want to break through the PR mm -hmm. and show you how to actually do public relations in a way that's organic. So yeah. You're building an audience that you can actually, that they actually care for you, that you can continue posting because you've earned it. And that then you can actually get results from. Uh, so it was very interesting for us to see if we can kill the old wall and show how we differentiate ourselves, that's when our, it's going to click in our target audience. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so when you can think about what's the old wall, what's the old way of doing things and how you can do it better or how your company does it or how your personal brand does it, that's how I think clicks and makes sense for the audience of like, okay, now I understand why I'm doing this. Yeah. And I think that's a very practical step of like, find your enemy and then beat them. Yeah, yeah. And he was adding to that, and sorry for rambling, but no, it's he, good. he was talking about once you beat them, own the market and, and name it. So for us, uh, then it made me think of like, how could we name what we do? Like for example, Drift named it conversational marketing, mm -hmm. right? And, and when we think about conversational marketing, we think about them. Um, so for us, something that we're starting to implement now is calling it an inbound CEO. Mm. So if you're an inbound CEO, you want to work with us. You're a CEO that cares about people coming to you versus going out to them. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's how we want to name our market moving forward. That's awesome. And that dictates our content. That dictates our copy on the landing page. That dictates how we like sign up on the emails. Mm -hmm. um, so it's what we're saying, right? Now we have we have this story. Now let's practically hey, transfer it and share that. Um, yeah. So kill the enemy and then name the market it, it's something that i got out and we're implementing and i think makes a lot of sense that's outstanding and then i couldn't agree with you more i mean i think this goes back to gary v and uh saying how everybody needs to be their own media brand and yeah, exactly. that, that treat themselves as a media brand like you have infinite more opportunities than uh sitting behind a linkedin company page and praying that someone looks at uh, at your profile and, and engages and we know that's just not the case so the earned aspect of it uh, makes it feel more worth it, right? And I think makes it feel more, orga more organic and authentic. Yeah, and, and it delivers better results, which is what yeah. we care about, right? Um, yeah. And then when you, I think you can take things in step further, right? That's a yeah. mission of the company, but how yeah. does it relate to my personal mission? For myself, I've always been somebody that really values self-sufficiency. Yeah. Like, I, I was a Spanish kid with an accent who knew no fucking body. Yeah. Uh, and people were not giving me shit because uh, I come from a single mom. I, I never met an entrepreneur until I met my girlfriend at 21 in Barcelona, who is from LA, but she was living here, ex-girlfriend. Um, and she was the first entrepreneur I ever met. Yeah. Like, at 21, I didn't even think this was possible. So for me, self-sufficiency has always been key. And I know Forbes is not gonna let me publish that, even though my articles are better than everyone's there. I know fucking uh, CBS is not gonna give me a TV show. Right. I know. You know, I don't know what it's going to give me stuff. So I have to build it myself. So I have my own podcast instead of a TV show. I write on Medium instead of for Forbes. Right. I, I write on LinkedIn. I write on Twitter. Yeah. Because that's my self-sufficient way of I'm going to take care of things myself. And I want people to own their audiences and do it themselves and not wait for permission. Fuck permission. Yeah. Especially with content how it is right now. Like, you should be able to control your own stuff. Yeah. Versus letting people say, yes, you're good enough. Fuck you. Sorry. <laughs> you, can, you can believe all these things. 
no, I'm not going to delete any of this. It's all, it's going to go under the explicit version of the podcast. And uh, I'm sorry, YouTube moderators, but we're doing it live. Um, well, that, that's awesome. And, and obviously, Marty, I can hear the passion in your voice. And I think the audience will be able to, to understand that as well. Like, uh, this is your passion. This is what you do. Like, you are living proof, living testament of how, um, I mean, like, even like the your name of your company's Influence Podium, right? Like, that it's about raising people up to have influence on their own owned, uh, you know, podium basically. And yeah. uh, I, I love how strong that imagery is. I love how it's so core to who you are and what you do. Um, and I think that's a really good, good place for us to, to start wrapping this thing up. So, um, Marty, if people want to hear more about you and I know you're an active podcaster and you're active on Twitter and LinkedIn, um, what's the best place, the number one best place for people to find you? Yeah, the best place is to email. So Marty, M-A-R-T-I at influencepointing.com. Cool. Um, that's the way that to like talk one-on-one. -on -one. Obviously, LinkedIn and Twitter is where we, you can consume my content. But if you want to reach out to me, email is the best way. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for dropping the uh, international knowledge. Uh, we, we appreciate it. You're going to be the first to uh, be off, off U.S. soil. But uh, we're super excited to get you back here in, in 30 days, coming back to, to New York. So... Absolutely. Um, you know, we're, once all this craziness calms down, uh, I think I owe you a beer or two. So uh, we'll make it happen. Awesome, Ryan. Hi, Marty. Uh, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. See ya. Sounds good.